Hey guys, Mr. Young here with your first flipped video of the school year and today we're going to be talking about the prehistoric world. So as you know, the flipped classroom is a new thing we're doing here in Global 9. So something that you should have out in front of you right now is your note sheet and maybe you have a hard copy of it. Uh, otherwise you could have it downloaded from my webpage which will allow you to type right into it if you're using your laptop or your uh, tablet whatever device that you're using so when you see the word prehistoric or prehistory I'm sure you have some images that come into your mind for a lot of people you may think of like dinosaurs or cavemen kinda like the picture of the guy here um, for our purposes we're gonna be talking about prehistory in terms of a time period before writing was established and we're going to look at human beings and human being like creatures that lived in these time periods before uh, history was recorded. So what you may not know is that people go back millions and millions of years ago. And so for us to understand how they lived, we have to use different methods. Um, because we don't have written records of what really happened. So think about if you come into my classroom, you look all around and you see history textbooks. And history textbooks are full of information, whether it be dates, battles that were fought, civilizations, accomplishments, languages, whatever it may be. The reason we have all that is because somebody took the time to write that down. And importantly, that written language was developed. So when these early humans were living, they didn't have written language that we think of and take for granted today. So if we want to figure out how do they live and what do they do, how are we supposed to know this? Well, historians who put these pieces together rely a lot on scientists. And there's three types of scientists that really help in this process. We've got archaeologists, paleontologists, and anthropologists. And then determining the age of things, we use this process called radiocarbon dating. So we're going to take a look at a little of what each of these scientists do. So the first type of scientists we got are archaeologists. So if you've ever seen uh, the Indiana Jones movies, Indiana Jones here, he was an archaeologist. Now, Indiana Jones is doing some digging up of some a lot more interesting artifacts okay you know he's looking for uh, jewels or these um, idols or emblems um, archaeology generally though is just kinda of boring okay you're looking at digging up artifacts or things that are made by humans and left behind by humans so whether it be pottery tools clothing anything that can tell us a little bit about the way that people lived so you may think okay you got a piece of cloth what does that mean what does that tell us or you got a piece of pottery what's so important about that um, a lot of times when archaeologists find pieces of pottery for example they'll have pictures of gods or goddesses or maybe people farming or doing some type of ritual so it can give an insight into the culture that the people had and the way that they lived. So imagine that your bedroom, okay, was abandoned today and for thousands of years it was abandoned. And then after all this all this time, scientists came in and they started digging around and looking at that stuff and looking at what CDs you had or maybe what DVD collections or what type of clothes that you wore or if you had a TV or a gaming system or a guitar or whatever you had. All right, They could start to put together um, a picture of what you were like and what types of things that you did and try to come up with who you were as a person. So that's kind of what archaeologists will do. Next we've got paleontologists, and these are the people that deal directly with fossils. And they're the ones that tend to dig up fossils, as you can see these two scientists doing right here. All right, obviously they have a dinosaur. Uh, paleontologists don't only dig up dinosaurs, they dig up animals, human beings, um, fossils. So fossils are anything, it could be a full skeleton, like the dinosaur here. It could be a piece of a bone, a full bone, a skull, um, something... Uh, that's an actual remain of a living creature. So what can this tell us about people? Alright, so scientists can look at the bones, what kind of condition they're in, um, how frail they may be, maybe they're really strong. So this could give an insight to what types of food they ate because their diet uh, will a lot of times affect how strong their bones were and whether or not they were tall people, short people. Um, it, all, it all gives some type of piece of information to put into the story about who people were. 
And then finally, we have anthropologists. So anthropologists kind of take all this information and put it together and try to understand what the culture of a people was like. So the simplest way we can describe culture is the way of life that people follow. So each one of us has our own culture that we follow. So base, usually this has to do with the way we were brought up. So maybe our family or our group of people uh, that you're associated with have a certain way that you live. Um, so within cultures, there can also be subcultures, like little different variations of the ways that people uh, live their life. So anthropologists will say, okay, we got these bones, we got these pieces of, uh, of pottery, clothing, and we have a location of where we found all this stuff. So we can start to put together what these people were really like and start to get a really good picture of what these guys were all about. Which brings us to radiocarbon dating, the process by which scientists can determine how old something is. So when something dies and we have no records left behind, we need to use this scientific process which determines the age of something by discovering how many carbon atoms are left within it. So all living things and non-living things contain carbon and when an, an item is found they take a look at how much carbon is left in it. So the fewer amounts of carbon atoms that there are the older that the object is because it's been breaking down and decomposing for a longer period of time. So this can be done with artifacts left behind by humans it can also be done with human remains as well. So we're going to break up the course of human existence into two distinct eras, the Paleolithic and the Neolithic eras. So the Paleolithic era began more than two million years ago, also known as the Old Stone Age. And people during this time period were nomadic. They wandered from place to place, hunting and gathering their food. So these people were constantly on the move because they constantly had to eat. And the way that they acquired their food was through hunting, okay? Animals don't stay in one place, they need to eat as well, so they go where the food is. And gathering uh, by collecting fruit, vegetables, nuts, other types of plants. Okay, So the major thing you want to take away from that is that there's no settlements, no civilizations. People can't stay in one spot. I mean, if they did, after a period of time, they would run out of food and they would die out. So these people were constantly moving to follow their food sources. Um, these people were generally pretty simplistic uh, human beings. They started to develop some written languages during this period uh, and had simple tools made of bone, stone, or wood. Uh, the reason being is this is what they had available to them. So parts of the Paleolithic Age were actually ice ages as well. So in the course of our history, of the history of the Earth, we're coming out of an ice age. Um, we might say, well, if the Ice Age ended 100,000, 80,000 years ago, how are we coming out of an Ice Age? Well, if you look at the grand scheme of things in terms of how old the Earth is, okay, the Earth has been dated back to be millions and millions of years old. Okay, 100,000 years isn't really that long a period of time. So we are technically still coming out of an Ice Age. Um, so during the Paleolithic Age, sheets of ice covered some parts of the Earth. And as the Earth became warmer, and the ice melted, sea levels went down, which showed these land bridges which surfaced. And the animals started to move across these land bridges. And the people that were hunting them followed the food source. And human beings began to migrate from Africa all over the rest of the world. Okay, And they also began to use fire in order to survive. Okay, To ward off uh, animals, to use it as a light source, to cook food. It became a huge integral part of human existence. So uh, scientific theory believes that all people originated from East Africa. So if you look at the map here, you can see about 100,000 years ago. The next map I'll show you says it could go far back as 250,000 years ago that people uh, originated in Africa. And from there, they moved um, to India, to Europe, to what we call Oceania, New Zealand, Australia, and then lastly across the bridge to North America and South America. Okay, and they did this in a couple of ways. The most common was the way I just told you about, land bridges and moving across the continents themselves. Okay, but they also moved using coastal routes, which suggests that people were more advanced because they had the capabilities of building boats or barges in order to travel. You can see those routes, 
that are shown here on the yellow and green arrows. Okay, so we're talking 250,000 years ago, and then you can see how it spreads off across from India to Europe to Siberia to North America and South America over the course of time people began to move. So the next era of human existence um, is called the Neolithic era which begins with this Neolithic revolution also known as the agricultural revolution and this is a huge huge turning point for human existence and creates the modern world as we know it today. And when I say modern world, I don't mean that people were using computers and cars and all this stuff. What I mean is that they began to settle down in one spot to create settlements, to create civilization. And there were two things, two major changes that allowed them to do this. The first is farming and the second is domestication of animals. So farming really happens by accident. One day people have some seeds left over from some um, some fruits and vegetables that they ate and they throw them on the ground and they come back a couple of weeks later and they realize there's plants sprouting and they come back a couple of weeks later and realize there's now vegetables or fruits that are growing off of these plants so other people catch on to this idea and they start to throw seeds around and grow their own food and they realize that they don't need to go looking for vegetables and fruits anymore they can just grow them right where they are all right then domestication happens so instead of hunting animals and following them all over the world they decide to take a couple of these animals in and fence them in or pen them in and they can breed them so now they have a food source of animals right there and they don't need to move around anymore so this is kind of a uh, a snowball effect where they farm and stay in one place and have animals for domestication which leads to more production of food which allows population to increase which allows these bigger settlements which leads to organized societies which we know as civilization so here's a map of some of the earliest places where agriculture or farming take place and over the next couple of weeks we're going to talk about a couple of these places in more detail like the Fertile Crescent, like China, like Egypt um, just to name a few so in summary, the Paleolithic Age, we're talking about people in small groups moving around, hunting and gathering in order to live. Uh, very few spoken languages, no written languages yet, maybe some early cave paintings. A very simplistic society. And then the Neolithic Age, the big thing here is civilization, staying in one spot being able to farm, being able to domesticate animals, which leads to this bigger idea of society in an organized way of living. Okay, so make sure that you have all your notes written down that you need. You answer any questions that you have on the note sheet as well. If you have any questions for me personally, make sure you write them down at the bottom of your note sheet and bring them into class tomorrow and I will gladly help you out. Okay, so that's it for this lecture guys. I will see you in class tomorrow.